Uh, thanks for, jo for joining us for the City of Oklahoma City's video conference, Judiciary Committee meeting. We have a few announcements to make regarding the virtual meeting. If the video conference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 15 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to the next Judiciary Committee special meeting to be announced at a later date. Uh, the agenda and documents are located on okc.gov. And um, I'm gonna call the meeting to order and calling it to order is very special today because this is my sixth call of order starting with city council this morning at 8.30. So I hopefully we'll never have that many again. The first thing I'd like to cover is uh, Roman number number two, approval of the minutes, which were prepared by Gaylene. And Gaylene, I gotta say you did an out outstanding job on the minutes. Thank you. And uh, I did have a couple of questions for Cindy Richard and Councilwoman Nice. I was wondering if, did Mr. Fegans provide you with any of the information for you, Nikki, the zip code impacted areas, and um, for you, Cindy, some of the uh, uh, eviction info related to speci specifically to Oklahoma City. I was wondering if we got those, and if we didn't, we might send him out a reminder. Did you get anything, Nikki? Uh, I believe I did. I'm trying to look through some of my emails here. The last one I see from him is in February, unless I may be missing it. Well, we, we might, um, I'll get Debbie to make sure that the information that he was gonna send to Cindy and Nikki gets sent. The second thing I noticed in the uh, minutes uh, was something great that uh, Councilwoman Hammond came up with and that was requesting uh, Timothy Tardy, Tardy Bono uh, to be here today. Tim, we're glad to have you here and you were a part of our last minutes and there was an invitation extended. And so with that, um, the minutes, like I said, Gaylene, were well prepared. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Councilman Greenwell. Yes. Thank you. Councilwoman Hammond. Yes. Councilwoman Nice. Yes. Councilman Stonecipher. Please. Thank you. So Tim, uh, I know a little bit about you uh, from information that I've read and the materials that were passed out to us today. I did not know that you also taught a college class. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and then make your presentation, please? And we are honored to have you here today. Well, thank you for being here. It's, a, it's an honor to join you all. Um, I have the privilege of getting to work with LaShawn and Judge James as members of the CJAC, and um, uh, I, I, I've had some wonderful conversations with Judge James, but she said that after she retires, she's going to come and be an audience member in the CJAC meetings, and I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I am planning to make sure I cut off public comment once she retires. <laughs> Um, so she won't have a microphone. Um, but um, no, I really appreciate uh, both LaShawn and Judge James. And, and I've, um, I like to highlight the work of innovation. And so I've given um, LaShawn and, and Judge James the opportunity to present in front of the CJAC to talk about some of the great things you all are doing. And so let me give you, uh, my background is born and raised in um, Oklahoma City, Northwest, War Acres, Bethany area. Um, I have a very uh, close affinity for you all on city council because I was on the Bethany city council for one term um, before I moved to Washington DC to work for Senator Tom Coburn. And I was his um, counsel and handled judiciary committee and it was really through him that I got interested in the sort of justice reform conversation because he was um, on the Judiciary Committee and he was a doctor on the Judiciary Committee with a bunch of judges and lawyers and prosecutors. And um, so we were a little bit out of out of our scope. So he hired me because he needed an attorney uh, to sort of translate all that for him. And um, in the work on Criminal, federal criminal justice sentencing, I took a memo to him talking about 
one of the disparities with crack and powder cocaine. And we were talking about federal sentencing. And he said, well, you know, we need to really move these people out into treatment and some other program. And I said, what are you talking about, Senator? And he goes, well, I'm a doctor before I'm a senator. And these are medical and behavioral treatment issues. These aren't penal issues that need to be a uh, carceral correction. We didn't use the word carceral back then, correction. And it was when that was when I started opening my eyes to this discussion on justice reform back, this would have been 2006, really before that conversation was really called justice reform at the time. And so it's sort of exciting for me to come full circle back around to that. Um, I spent eight years in Washington. I'm five with the senator and three as a lobbyist. So I tell people I've been a lawyer and a lobbyist, so I can only go up from here. And um, but I'm really excited with um, what I'm doing on the CJAC. Uh, and so um, the CJAC, for those of you who don't know, is a creation of four entities, including Oklahoma City, but Oklahoma County, Oklahoma City, Edmond and Midwest City. And the purpose of the CJAC, it, it was created under the Interlocal Cooperation Act, and that allows the uh, governmental entities to join across jurisdictional boundaries to solve problems. And so this CJAC was created to solve uh, the issues with the overcrowding of the jail, uh, some of the court reform at the district courts. And so um, my goal, I say, there's sort of two mountains that I'm working on each, each day. One is how do we reduce improper jail overcrowding? How do we fix some of the facilities, do other things? And then how do we reform the court system um, so that we're not driving people into that facility that has all sorts of problems? So that's why I like to say Edmond, Midwest City, Oklahoma City, have all done their jobs on the municipal front, really trying to reduce the number of municipal people that are in the jail. And this CJAC was a, a, a result of the VERA report um, that came out and VERA Institute for Justice is a group in, in New York that goes around the country and studies justice systems, mainly at the local level, city, county, but sometimes state. And, and one of their recommendations was that you needed an ongoing body to help focus people on reform. And that's how the CJAC got created. But one of the things they highlight in that report is that the municipal violations in the jail, they thought were too high. And so taking that to heart, um, Chief City, uh, your all's office, the judges, the cities, each of the three cities really took on their own task to try to solve that. And so one of the reasons why our jail population has decreased is because the cities have done their part to reduce the municipal offenses that are in the Oklahoma County Jail. So I just want to uh, note that our municipalities are really leading the way on that. And I always like to, to highlight um, judges like Judge James and others in the municipal courts that are trying to be innovative and trying to be flexible um, and hopefully our district courts will start taking some of those ideas uh, to heart. And th they have, they're doing a good job as well. Um, but I, I just, um, I know having a heart from being a former municipal uh, city councilman, I know you all have a great opportunity to make changes, maybe a little more uh, nimbly than the district courts. So um, one of the things that the CJAC was required to do in their interlocal report is to put out quarterly and annual reports. And so that's what we have in the packet. Um, and so I'm going to try to share this screen unless anyone has any questions before we go into the numbers. Okay, I'm gonna go forward and try to share the screen. Okay, are you all seeing a green front cover that says Criminal Justice Advisory Council? Okay, I'm trying to slide yes. you all to the side. Okay, I'm gonna scroll down. Now, I, I do wanna say this is the second quarter of FY20, so this would have been February 2020 pre-pandemic. And I wanted to use those numbers because what you'll see is we were moving on a very encouraging trend um, 
And so just a little background on, on who these folks are that make it up. Uh, Clay Bennett of the Thunder, Tony Tyler, Tyler Media. So we have um, a lot of business and community leaders that in, are involved, um, Sue Ann Arnall, and then you have elected officials like uh, Board of County Commissioners has one, uh, Mr. Freeman, Chief Gorley, Judge James, City Manager of Midwest City, City Manager of Tulsa. Um, so that's, that's a group of them. Okay, so the the month before the pandemic, that quarter, um, you should be seeing a chart that says Oklahoma County jail population. Um, the trend had been that we were under 1650 and starting to go even lower. And um, to the far left, I always like to juxtapose it against the history of the jail, which has historically been over 2000 and really closer to 2500 the jail was built for um, 1200 maximum security single cells um, but pretty much since the late 90s early 2000s that number had been over um, 2000 and sometimes got as high as 26 and 2700 the, the the astounding thing to me as many times as i've given tours of the jail um, where now the population today, I believe, was 1515. Um, it's astounding to me to think that you could put an extra thousand people in that jail um, and still run it somehow. I don't know how they did it, but the, the just even that far left one, February 2015, this is pre Vera, pre the work that had been done with the task force, that jail population was 2403 on February 15th. Because we've been starting to take the jails, the sheriff's daily numbers that he was putting out before the trust came along, um, every day they would put out a report, but no one was collecting or doing anything with that data. So after we started collecting it, really, I think August 2019 was, well, it would have been a little earlier than that. We started taking their 30 day reports that we were getting every day and just making an average out of what they were giving us. And so we started now being able to track that as an average. Um, but that number was in their system for 20 years and no one was really looking at it um, other than when, you know, the DOJ came in or, or the health department. Um, but I wanted to point out, um, we, we broke down the total numbers on the above chart into smaller numbers. And if you look, um, the second column from the left shows the municipal only numbers. And so this is any municipality in Oklahoma County. Um, but for the most part, Oklahoma City tends to be obviously the largest one. And so the most, so before the pandemic, the numbers were in the 40s for what the municipal counts. If you just look to the far left column, that red column, in 2015, that number was 132. So just in the most recent years, um, because you all have done the work, there's 80 to 90 less people in the county jail um, on an average than had been even in 2015. If you go further back to 2010 and 2008, um, those numbers were even higher than that. Um, so again, it's a, it's a testament to what you all have accomplished. And so then in these quarterly reports, I just highlight things that are happening in the criminal justice system that I think are important. Um, obviously, we're excited about MAPS 4 and the focus it has on some of these items. Um, so here's another chart. This is the number of bookings um that would daily come into the jail and the the yearly average in 2019 was about 90 and we saw in january 20 that that was about the same it wasn't changing much so the the bookings were coming in still and what i think was happening is we were having uh, people released on uh, bond programs or other programs that they were um, getting out um, this is a sheet that shows a chart that shows the classifications so um uh, it's again we we try to remind people this was a maximum security jail so it wasn't created to have p 
people getting out a lot. It wasn't created with direct supervision, which is the current model now that people are out most of the day. Um, and programs were hard to deliver in the jail because they were maximum security and weren't set up well. But what you see in the population, according to the classification system that is um, a lot of people nationally criticize this system because it's outdated, but it's the National Institute for Corrections classification system of minimum, medium and maximum. And our current jail trust staff are looking at how do they redo this and maybe try to validate it on our own population. But for now, this is what is the national standard. And so you can see the, the maximum security is that top level hovers in that 30, 38 to 45 range. Medium is about the same. And, and what my concern has been over the last few years is that minimum number has, has been pretty steady at about 15%. And essentially what that's saying is that the jail staff, um, you know, the calculations to go into how you fall into these categories include your charges, your behavior in the jail. Um, so the sheriff would, the sheriff's staff would say minimum security likely means they're not a threat to themselves, they're not a threat to their cellmates, and they're not a threat to staff. And uh, I would argue that's probably an indication that we should look deeply at their case to consider is there an out of custody setting that would be more successful. If you take that population that's around 200 and reduce it, and, and not that everyone would get out, right? I mean, a, a person who's in for a murder on a first offense um, might be considered minimum because they don't have other charges and they might have behaved well. You know, you think of a, um, you can think of scenarios where someone's self-defense um, or, or something, but they're charged with murder. Um, and so they could be considered minimum. But for the most part, we suspect that minimum security is folks that have lower level charges and could get into an out of custody program. But if you re reduce the jail population out of that minimum security, we would now be talking about close to where we were when we built the jail, which is 1200. Um, so I'm always looking at where in the jail population are there opportunities to get people into out of custody programs to be successful versus in custody awaiting trial and being in a facility um, that is not to the to the what I think the community wants. Um, this is one, and and I'll get to a better chart, um, but this is inmates booked by race. Um, the blue number is white, uh, white. Um, the orange number is African American. The gray Hispanic. Uh, the yellow is Native American, and the top is other, which includes um, Asians. So the um, population for African Americans has been around 35%. I know that you can't, it's hard to see on this share screen. Um, and I think uh, it's about 13% is the countywide population for African Americans, somewhere in that ballpark. At least the VIR report used 13% as the comparison tool. And then by gender, that number has stayed pretty regular in that 25% range for women uh, versus men. And then these are just pretrial releases at the county level. I don't, I won't go into it. North Care has a program called day reporting, um, where especially if they have mental illness, um, they're able to get out through a North Care bond and get connected to services. And we, um, that number was starting to drop pre pandemic, it kept going down during the pandemic. And we're just starting to see an increase in that number again. Um, 60 is really, we almost want it to be higher. We think North Care says they have capacity for 70 or 80. And so we're trying to figure out how do we make that work better. Um, and so that's, that's for FY20. Then just um, in the pandemic, we were still able to put together an annual report that still I believe has um, good numbers that weren't skewed. 
because of the pandemic. The, the thing that skewed the numbers during the pandemic is that Department of Corrections stopped accepting people. And so our population went up um, dramatically from about 100 Department of Corrections people that were waiting. So these are people that have finished their county trial um, or pled. And so they're waiting to be taken to the Department of Corrections to start their sentence. Um, that number is usually in the 75 to 125 range. It was as high as 400 um, during the pandemic. So our, our jail populations were up around 1900 um, during the pandemic. In February of this year, they came and took a, a, a bunch of them. And I think today they were around 127, which is a reasonable number. But this is the chart that I like to show historic numbers on where we are today versus uh, where we've been for the last 20 years. Um, so the far left, I'm sorry, the far right column as you're looking at the chart are the one year averages for the 19 and then 2020. And you can see for the first time in a long time, we have settled into that area of 1,663 to, to even lower, 1,624. Um, and, and yes, that 1,624 number counts um, some of the pandemic time of April and May when everyone really was doing a good job on, you know, no one was going out, so there weren't arrests, the numbers dropped, but then it went back up for um, June as the DOC backup started going up. So that 1624 might be a little bit low, um, but it does match with 1663 from the year before. Um, and I don't know what we're going to look like this year because of those high numbers, but for April, May, the numbers have been under that 1624 number consistently. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what those numbers come out. But the historical background going all the way back to June of 2009, the one day jail count for June 30th was 2600 uh, people. Um, even going back to 1999, or I'm sorry, 2400, 2004, it was 2617. But I like to point out to people that that was the time the Department of Justice was coming and looking at the jail facility. So they started in 2003. They entered into the agreement, I believe, in 2009. It might have been 2008. But all during that time, the jail populations were in that 2500 range. Um, and so that's what they were looking at at the time. And so we've really, it's been almost two decades since we've been consistently at 1650 where we were pre-pandemic and where we've been post-pandemic if you want to call it if you want to say that um this is a number that again i think the city can be uh encouraged by the district courts can be encouraged by the number of people that are going to the department of corrections from oklahoma county has steadily dropped the last uh three years and the FY20 number, I was able to include in that the number of people waiting to go to DOC that had been sentenced um, on June 30th. So I think that 1699 number is a real number that I, I'm confident in shows the continuing decline. Um, but as we talk about justice reform statewide, um, I've said to people repeatedly as I've been out in the public, to the extent that Oklahoma County and the municipalities are taking this on seriously and trying to increase the number of programs and out of custody services that are available, we are doing our part as the largest county in the state in trying to reduce the prison overcrowding. Um, and that's because we're putting them in programs like drug court and community sentencing and now the diversion of um, you know, all those things are coming to, to the bear at the time when we're really focused on this. So um, I'm very optimistic about MAPS 4 and once that funding comes online and the extra tools we have in our tool belt um, that, that we can continue this trend of um, helping to reduce the state population by us doing our part. Also, I have to give credit to Tulsa County they have similar programs. They're really working hard. And so I think when you've got your two 
largest pipelines to DOC, both trying to make improvements, you're, you're starting to see the statewide numbers drop a little bit. And then these are those numbers that are, are more clear than the previous one. For um, gender on the right, it's still at 75, 25%. And then African American, white, Hispanic, and um, Native American is that number, 51% white, 34% African American. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's really, we, we talked again, again about the work of maps for the jail trust obviously coming on was a big thing and then we just talked about the pandemic but as far as um and then i always get a kick out of this um not, it, it's really not i should be more serious about it um for the longest time we've known the jail locks have been a problem and so the, the cjap really pushed the county to start uh, supporting the sheriff's effort to put new locks in and so they put the first round during last year and now this year they put in another round and so now we have uh, three full floors that have uh, new working locks um, which provides safety to both the inmates and to staff and so um, you know you, you wouldn't think that you'd have to worry about a jail not having working locks but um, we we've, we've had that problem unfortunately so those um, are the main charts that i wanted to show you and then I can go back to any of them or I can answer any other questions. And I think LaShawn, that was the, the heart of what you all wanted me to present if I, if I understood correctly. That is correct, Tim. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, the one thing I would like to point out and, and I appreciate your comments on how we have done a good job and we're a testament to, we should be a testament to what we've accomplished, but. I don't think that's completely accurate. I think the, the accurate way to say it is um, we owe Judge James, we owe Cindy Richard, we owe LaShawn Thompson, and we owe, owe Pete White for doing a great job. And um, they brought around a lot of this change and, and we're really proud of that. And I hope we can continue to accomplish that. And looking at your, uh, Tim, your two uh, reports, um, I, I marked a couple of uh, portions. It says the, the future looks bright, for continued improvements in the Oklahoma County jail system. And then it says, however, CJAC members and partners must be careful to not grow weary in well-doing and keep pushing the momentum to new positive levels. You go on to say that it is appropriate to pause to reflect on and celebrate the numerous points of progress that have been made, but such temporary celebration should give way to the sober and formidable, formidable task still ahead for the C for CJAC and its partner agencies to expand justice in Oklahoma County. What do we do? What, what, how do we move forward with this formidable task uh, and expand justice in Oklahoma County? Well, um, as I said, I think, I think MAPS 4, uh, you know, um, to the extent that they're deciding which projects go first, um, one of the things we were very supportive of, obviously, was the diversion hub, the, the progress that's been made there. I was there last week visiting, and I believe they said they have 600 cases that they're under case management already. Um, those are 600 people that could have ended up in the county jail. Um, the community sentencing program that is run out of team and their pretrial program, um, that's about another two to 400 there um, again north care with their population getting closer to 80 um, you know those are all people that likely could have ended up in jail um, and somehow through an assessment or through a judicial um, you know dialogue with the provider a judge felt comfortable releasing that person then on your all's front um, you know i know site and release has has been uh, working the bond program you all have started. Um, those are all people. And then the penalty reduction program, I didn't highlight it in these two, but in one of my more recent reports, we highlighted the penalty reduction program and, and you all know it better than I do, but those were all, there were a, a, a hand load of uh, a certain number of those that were at the stage 
where they had warrants out that if they weren't settled, they would have ended up in the jail. Those are the kinds of things that I'm hopeful we should keep pushing, keep expanding. The other ones that I'm very optimistic about is, is the, um, the uh, crisis intervention center pieces that are in the, the MAPS 4, um, because those will help us with our challenges the police department faces um, on dealing with mental health, uh, um, those that are dealing with mental health as they're getting out there on police calls. You know, also I'm on the law enforcement policy task force um, and the community working group of the city manager. Um, the, the conversations we're having about alternatives, de-escalation, community accountability board, um, but the, the way the opportunity to think about how do we help the police officers not have to engage in a situation that could, you know, that's probably not going to have a good result by having alternatives um, related to like the homeless team today, we just talked about the homeless outreach team. We're looking at models in other parts of the um, country on mental health engagement um, for the police officers that we bring other people into that conversation. So, to, so the reason I'm optimistic is there are so many players that have a mindset of how do we do better? How do we improve? And so that's what makes me optimistic. The culture of the players involved are towards improvement, not status quo. And then, although the, the first year for the jail trust has been uh, up and down at best, um, you know, you all are well familiar with Jim Couch and his abilities. Um, you know, I'm really confident that those citizens um, are moving in the right direction. Jim's got a great ability to manage major projects like that. Um, they're starting to gain some traction on hiring and improvement. Um, but more importantly, that again, it's a cultural shift that they're going under there about how to treat inmates with more humanity, trying to improve longstanding um, mechanical issues that as you listen to their reports, you just um, shake your head at things like they had no airflow out of the building. And so that was what was causing some of the mold. They fixed that. They dealt with the shower issues, flushing issues, just things that have been essentially 20 years of delayed maintenance. They're now bringing that into bear. And so, but more importantly than the physical structure is the focus from the leadership at the trust on programs and how do we bring people into the jail that can safely provide educational treatment, other options um, that simply just haven't been there and, and frankly can't occur when you have a population of 2,500. When you have a population of 1,500, you can at least start dreaming about those things. And so, I mean, a Councilman, I'll, I'll say I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of person, um, but, you know, I'm also a, a lawyer and lawyers' jobs are to build evidence and build a case. And I can find all sorts of evidence across Oklahoma City, Edmond, Midwest City, um, and the county of, you know, little shoots of green buds and flowers on efforts to try to get this problem under control. We appreciate all you do. Does anybody else have, Joe Beth, you, this was your idea. Yeah, I do have a few questions. Um, I'm curious because I know I have some rumblings in my head that about bail and how it relates to our jail um, that I just can't remember all the figures for because your example of well someone was in for you know even if it was self-defense maybe but if someone's in for murder and I mean if if they can afford bail it doesn't matter you know what it was for like if, if bail is available and they have funds and have access to funds and they can get out with only limited interaction with the court system until their trial. I'm curious, where does bail fit into how many people are in our jail on a regular basis and what from the city level can we be doing to advocate for changes in that realm? So um, yeah, that's a great question. One I get regularly and I haven't had a good answer for it recently. 
um, until we've started getting a report that's called a low bond report that essentially says of the people that are in there for $5,000 or less, you know, how many are they and who are they? And the reason we started doing that was because the Oklahoma City Bail Project, um, their cap on the kind of people they get out is at 5,000 and below. And so um, now with the new data system that the jail has, um, that's gonna become a regular report that the Bail Project can pull and I need to actually follow up with them because I believe they said that they're finally able to get that um, automated where they're getting it on a regular basis. But, but that's, that's the real question is how many of those people, you know, are a good candidate for a program like the bail project that pays their bail and then puts them in programs. Um, that's just another uh, piece that's there. Um, and then, from our previous conversation, um, Councilwoman, I wanted you to know um, I've asked o Open Justice Oklahoma to look into that question of um, length of stay related to the charges um, so we can see how long are people in there and what are those charges. Now, obviously, we know with um, you know some of the more violent crimes where those trial processes take long with continuances and evidentiary hearings um, that you're, you're hearing, you know, anecdotally, I hear regularly, you know, a murder trial is going to take a year to two years um, to process through the system. But the, the, to me, the real question is, what about some of those lower level charges? Is there a way to do that? And Mr. Ravitz likes to talk about, um, you know, he'd love to partner with the DA on a, a sort of quick trial triage system to determine are there candidates that are lower level that we could either plead out or, or you know, get to a trial more quickly so they're not spending so much time in jail. And so the jail's new system is, um, my tracking of them was March 22nd, they switched the flip, they, they flipped the switch and so we're just now to the point where they're starting to backload historical data. And uh, Ryan Gensler told me today that they have been able to look back to 2015. And so um, he and I are supposed to talk next week about what they are seeing as their ability to provide some new information. And so hopefully future reports of mine will incorporate some of their data that they're starting to dig into. And then I've, I've contracted with them to create a dashboard um, similar to what Tulsa County has um, here for Oklahoma County. So that's a, hopefully that's a fiscal year 22 where by the end of this calendar year or early next calendar year, um, I'll be able to reveal some sort of dashboard where as much of this data as possible can be public. Like the low bond amount, that's one that I think we can't, Obviously, we don't want to put the name of the people in there. People can look them up on OCN, but some of this aggregated data as to how many people are in there for 5,000 or 10,000 or less, because that really gets to your question of, well, what do we do with bail reform? Um, and so we're, we're committed to letting the data drive decision making um, as long as we feel comfortable that that data is good. And that's why we hired Ryan um, to help us with that. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like that would be helpful to know. <laughs> it's like and I you got to figure we, out what you don't know to be able yeah, to. Yeah, we, we contracted with Ryan at, in, in what they do. We have a contract with him. We didn't hire him. Yeah, and then I guess my other question, and you sort of spoke to it with the culture, talking about the culture of people wanting, you know, to move to for change. And I guess I, I guess I just, I sort of struggle with that because I, so I have a pretty good friend who's a public defender and the stories she brings, uh, I say home, but you know, when we get together, uh, she, we all, we live in the same building. So that's why I said it like that. Oh. But um, uh, I, I'm trying to think of a, of the best way so to say me, this. Let me it's, try to answer that without you having to, I, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I, I should, I just should say it, but the conversations, the stories she brings home are pretty devastating as far as, um, 
and, and sort of seem, don't seem like they, they jive with this feeling that the culture is that people want something different because so much of the cases she's dealing with are really low, low level, like often, you know, very obviously connected to someone's health, well-being that has gotten them into some, you know, pop being in poverty. And that's what's kind of brought them to, you know, have a case with her and the sort of, um, desire to keep folks in the system seems very palpable based on what um based on those those uh, just the work she does on a day-to-day -day basis so i guess what what opportunities are there for more culture change i suppose or um because it just it still seems like there's like something that sort of feels like it gets in the way um, of, of real, of the transformative change that we've seen, at least at the, on the municipal level um, through our court system? So, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I said I was a glass half full kind of person. I didn't say I was Pollyanna. And um, I, I'm not uh, um, unaware of the significant challenges we still have in our county justice system. You know, the, the Vera Institute one of the things they pointed out was that, um, that we, we call it the justice system, but um, they, they argue in their report that there was really not a system in that there wasn't any sort of shared goals, shared vision. There certainly wasn't um, a regular collaborative uh, conversation. And so, um, you know, so, so the, the courts, the district attorney, the jail, the sheriff, police chiefs, um, city managers, uh, you know, city councilors, um, all these people make up a really big pie. And so as you look at that pie, you can see um, areas of improvement and areas that still need to improve. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I have a great, um, uh, appreciation for the work that uh, prosecutors and public defenders do um, and, and that's really hard work and so I can understand that perspective um, and as far as what what how do things get different you know we just um, elected our first African-American sheriff in Oklahoma County um, who campaigned along with his you know, the interesting thing about that race is both candidates um, had similar opinions of the kind of changes they wanted as law enforcement officials. Um, and, and so there wasn't, uh, there, there was a lot of similarities. Uh, we have another consequential election coming up in 2022 with the district attorney's race. Uh, the current district attorney has said he's not running, um, he publicly has come out. And so those are those opportunities of, um, you know, new people with new ideas um, and how does that change our system? Um, and then, you know, with the judiciary, they're up for election on a regular cycle and we've had uh, several new judges elected, um, several new judges appointed um, with openings. And so uh, those, you know, elections have consequences. And so uh, those are some of the places where I think you're going to hear candidates um, talking about these issues more. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with Chief Gorley, Chief Younger in, in, um, in Edmond, the police chief in Midwest City just left. You know, all three of them shared notions of, you know, we want to lock up the people that are threats to the public. And then people who need help, we want to figure out how do we get them into programs to get them help. And so um, it's a cultural shift. Um, so, but but I think you know if you weigh the balance of people moving towards um, a more efficient, more fair system, um, I think the balance is moving in the right direction. have some other agenda items, but I wanted to touch just briefly on one other subject, Tim, and that is the, the history of the jail building. And I think you'd appreciate this being a former, former city councilor. 
uh, I recently got a call from a constituent that was complaining about the jail building and the history of the jail building and who designed it and how it was built. And uh, the one thing that that person did mention, uh, and I don't know if it's true or not, that there's almost an identical jail built in Fort Worth, Texas, he was saying. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's not true. Um, is this a building that's redeemable? You talk about uh, new locks, you talk about ventilation, uh, you talk about dealing with uh, toilet problems. Uh, uh, just briefly your thoughts on the building itself. So um, I didn't hear about Fort Worth. What I heard was Reno, Nevada. There was a group that went out to Reno and they had, or Las Vegas, it was somewhere, and they had a skyscraper type jail. And that was what, what made them think about that, doing that here. Uh, the, the, the reality um, was that, that I think there was um, various deficiencies and, and I haven't gone into all the history, but you know, I remember the first time I heard of Oklahoma County Jail, I was in college watching a couple of a weeks or months after it had opened. Um, and a helicopter um, flying around the jail because there had been an escape within the first month. And just as a college student, I remember thinking, that doesn't seem right that in the <laughs> first month after it's built, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about anything at that point. I was a history major. And um, I thought that doesn't make sense that in the first month they've already had a breakout. Um, but what I, I'll say about this is and it, it dovetails into our latest meeting at the CJAC. Um, we have a facility subcommittee whose job is to look at the various issues related to the jail and the facility subcommittee recommended to the CJAC that we um, hire a consultant to do a new study of the jail to uh, answer that question exactly, Councilman. Um, is it redeemable? Uh, what, what would it look like if we were to do a new jail? Um, you know, what would the tax consequences be? And, and we've already gotten some uh, public pushback from people saying, why are we doing another study? We just need to tear it down and start over. And, and one of the things I say is, well, every study that I've looked at before always contemplated a jail population of 2,500 to 3,000 and, and cost uh, anywhere from 250 million to over 300 million. Um, the fact that we've been consistently under 1650 now for over a year when you even through the pandemic when you take out the doc numbers we we've stayed in that range of the green um that we've talked about 1663 to 1624. um we've never had a consultant talk to us about what does a 1500 bed jail look like what does that cost what would be the burden for the taxpayer in that situation and now that we have a trust they have more opportunity to consider financial options. They're both an operational trust and a financial trust. So they have more, more tools in their toolbox to consider, are there other revenue raising measures where they could build that? And so I've said to the public, all the previous studies I consider obsolete because we're in a totally different place with the population. We now have a trust running the jail instead of the sheriff. And we have made some improvements where we are starting to see maybe there is some life to this facility um, and maybe we need to build a smaller, maybe just a minimum security or medium or all the ideas are still out there. And I don't wanna prejudge anything, but we are hiring a consultant um, that will do that. And one of the things we'll do because um, LaShawn and, and uh, Judge James are on the, the CJAC, they'll have opportunities, obviously, with the city manager. You know, I'd, I'd be happy to have this committee talk to that consultant on what your all's dreams are, of what a future facility might look like. And so we're going to ask the public, we're going to ask former residents, um, we're going to ask groups like the Diversion Hub and North Care, you know, what's your vision? Because what we want to do is make the intake area much more hospitable two groups that can help a judge make a decision more quickly on is this someone that could be in an out of custody placement or do they need to be um, waiting trial in custody and so um, I hate to say I don't have a good answer for you councilman but I'll, I'll say um, let's talk about that in a couple of months. Any other questions from anyone? 
No mm -hmm. questions for me. I just wanted to say, oh, sorry. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. And uh, clearly, um, it's it's difficult to get numbers during uh, a pandemic such as this, but I know we've been able to work through a lot of those challenges. And I, um, I'm hopeful that we'll see some better and different outcomes as well. Um, and I know we've been doing some great things on our city level. Um, as far as our, our county level is concerned, I, I hope we can see some some better improvements uh, pertaining to uh, one, the loss of life, two, um, interactions pertaining to uh, maybe what happened in March uh, to the young man that was shot and killed um, and just how we can I don't even know what to say about it. Just how do we better those those uh, relationships and practices? That's what I wanted to say, the practices that we have uh, pertaining to those types of situations. So I know that's all you know. easier said than done, but um, I'm thankful that you all are dedicated to this work. And I know we'll continue to also see some of these conversations uh, pertaining to our 21CP. Um, consultants being here and I'm hopeful if you can help me with that before it's all said and done uh, that we get uh, most if not all of these board members in front of 21 CP so they can also uh, speak to the things that they would would like to see pertaining to law enforcement and and how our judiciary committee can also be a part and helpful in those conversations so thank you again. Hey, Tim, this is David Greenwell. One question, you know, a few weeks ago, there was a ruling or an agreement that individuals that are apprehended, say in Cleveland County, Canadian County, or some other county within Oklahoma City uh, will be taken to their uh, county jail. What impact will that have going forward once that's more fully implemented, or is that a question to be determined? Um, well, my, my, my guess is that it might further lower the population because those people were waiting in our, our county jail until those counties um, accepted is not the right word. Cindy could correct me on that, but um, you know, how, however they were transferred to those other counties. And, and Councilman, that, that's actually, that problem is not unique. Um, we have, um, I can't remember that one of the, the intake, the supervisor over intake did a, a poll. I think it was 65 on one particular day that were in the Oklahoma County Jail that had out of county holds, um, which meant we were ready to release them through our district court, but another district court had put a hold or they had an active warrant in another county. And so that that situation of, and I'm sure it happens in their jails and other counties as well, but that situation of holding. And so our, our county staff at the jail um, have tried to increase the effort to call them and say, you know, we really need you to come pick them up. It's, it's been, you know, I think he had one that had been there 12 days. Um, it was closer to 10 days was the average than it was five days. And so those are just the kind of people that you, you look at your jail population and you think, who doesn't need to be here for all these various reasons? Um, but my, my guess in this current situation is that they'll end up in Cleveland and Canadian County Jail quicker which means we'll be holding them less. I don't know if Cindy agrees with that or not. It depends on if they also have Oklahoma County charges, I think. Yeah. So I'm not sure how many, and Steve yeah. Christ, you're on the line. I, I don't know if you know how many people we have that are, that our police pick them up in Oklahoma City, but in another county. Um, so I, do you do you know those kind of raw numbers? No, I, I don't know um, any any with any kind of specificity what kind of numbers we have. I know that we we pay for an average of two out of county prisoners per day as part of our contract. So we at least contemplate two prisoners per day that are out of county holds. 
for those of you that don't know, Steve Price is the legal advisor for uh, the police department. Um, so he's in my criminal justice division, but that is his function. But Councilman Greenwell, I just asked that same supervisor to refresh those numbers for me this earlier today because we have a pretrial subcommittee, which is a little similar to this committee for the CJAC. And that's one of the things I've wanted them to look at. And so now post pandemic, or now that we're getting into that post pandemic stage, I've wanted to look at those numbers again. So um, thank you for bringing that up. And, and it is my, am I correct that they still book them at the Oklahoma County Jail, even if they're arrested in a different county, and then at some point in time, they eventually transfer them to the other county. Is, does anyone correct. know? That's yeah. correct, Council, Councilman Greenwell. Okay. And my staff also monitors those inmates that are in that type of situation scenario to ensure that uh, we communicate with those other counties to see when they're gonna pick up those prisoners. You know, when we were in the middle of the pandemic, they wouldn't trans transfer to a different county unless that person tested negative for COVID-19. So my staff was really diligent about keeping up with those uh, prisoners and contacting the other jurisdictions to see when would they pick up their, when would they be picking up their prisoners? Yeah, I, and I don't know this, but I suspect those jails in the surrounding counties may not be as fully utilized as say the Oklahoma County Jail. I just, I'm guessing at that, but I don't know that for sure. They definitely don't have the numbers that we do, Councilman Greenwell. Okay, Tim, thank you very, very much. Uh, come back and see us soon. And uh, with the task ahead, if there's any way we can help, please call. Well, thank you all and, and just uh, keep up the good work, I'd say. Thank you. Uh, LaShawn, the next uh, four, five, and six on the agenda, could you just give us a very brief uh, discussion of each one of those? Yes, I uh, will. Thank you, Councilman uh, Stonecipher. So in, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the daily average and the release data. So in March, our daily, uh, our daily average for the month of March was 11 inmates. The release time in March was 14.3 hours. In April, uh, our daily average was 15, and the release time dropped to 9.7. In May, um, our daily average was 8, and the release time uh, dropped to, well, the, it, it increased to 10.5. So we have decreased our release time. They have decreased their release times from January and February to about one to two hours. So we're still averaging about a 10 hour hold on inmates uh, being released from Oklahoma County. And I'd be happy to take any questions. If the one thing I remember, you know, just historically Oklahoma County lawyers, uh, many of them used to have an owner cognizance card that they would they would acquire through the county bar and were able to mm -hmm. uh, get people out of jail in shorter periods of time. And that's, I think the card still exists, but I don't think they're really used anymore. Is that something that could be revived to help shorten that time for people getting out of the jail sooner to cut our costs? If they're I speak to that. This is Judge yep. James. It is those Oklahoma County recognizance cards are still used and they're used quite often in Oklahoma City Municipal Court. So they are, I don't know about district court, but they are used in our court. Okay, LaShawn, thank you. Okay. And um, let's go with the penalty reduction program. I am pleased to announce as of today, we've closed 3,255 cases. We've dismissed 1,161 failure to appears and we have hit our mark. We just hit $500,000 today. And so that was the program's go. That's where we are. So I'm excited about that. And this program is scheduled to, uh, I mean, this program is scheduled to end uh, June the 30th, 2021. So we're doing really good with the penalty reduction program. Okay, so one question I have, uh, and, and I appreciate everybody's comments. Since we went through the pandemic, 
can we extend that program to the end of December? Your thoughts? Yes, I will help move that motion. <laughs> I was about to ask the same thing because I well, and part of my question, LaShawn, is so this is still with whatever that first um like you had it this this had to have occurred by this date. I can't remember what that is now. <laughs> is right. But uh -huh. but we all did. of those, all of the what we've come up to so far is for that date and prior. Is that right? No, we, we made some modifications to the date doing this last, Gailene, and, and jump in if I'm incorrect, or Cindy, we did make some, some changes to the date because when we moved the date, we moved the time frame in which the warrants could be issued during that time frame. Okay. That's what I think we bumped it a year, Councilwoman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because I was kind of curious if, if it's just like taken this long to get that enough word out, or if you thought you caught a few more people that had warrants that maybe had just missed that original deadline. But, so that, that would be my question too. So if we decide to approve this today and extend it, so that would move our date again, as far as being able to capture folks, or are we gonna keep it the same date we had prior? We can certainly do that. And of course this has to be um, passed by council as a whole. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to extend the, the checkoff date for, for how far back we go, we can certainly change that. Um, and my only concern from a prosecution perspective, um, and I voice this concern every time, is um, I don't want people to think, oh, if I dodge my responsibility, if I don't go to court, I'll eventually fall into this group where you know I can um, get my failure to appear dismissed and this and that. I just, I don't want people to, to fall into that category because the truth is, is they can certainly be picked up on a warrant. Um, and so that's what I don't want to have happen to people. Um, in, in my mind, it, it would go no further than December 31st. And, and I'd be interested in David's comments because David, you were kind of came up with the number on how far we went back uh, when we originally did this. Yeah, Mark, so it's it's similar to Cindy's. After a while, these amnesty programs begin to lose their effectiveness. And uh, from a tax standpoint, tax authority standpoint, what you there's a study that showed people actually became more aggressive if they felt like, oh, I'll just kind of take the lottery approach and file the returns as I best see them knowing that uh, if I get caught, you know, all I have to do is just wait for the amnesty program to come back in play and no penalties, no interest, and I'm good to go. So that's the risk you run, uh, you know, in terms of the time frame that you provide for. I mean, I, I'm in shocked that we were able to raise $500,000 in revenue and um, I know when we first did it, it started out really slow. It picked up some steam and then it kind of slowed back down um, because of the pandemic. And, and so um, I, I don't want this to go on forever, but I, I sure would like to entertain. Uh, we moved the date uh, to what it's kind of tied to what we've done previously. And um, we limit it to no later than December 31st. Yeah, I don't have any problems with changing the dates. I would like to see the data. And I would like for someone who had some time to pursue uh, actually interviewing people who have participated in this and just get uh, uh, as much of an in-depth study on this as possible. I think it'd be interesting. I think that's a great idea to interview some of those people just to get some feedback and how they how they learned about it and where yeah. we're, we're where our communications are working and where they're failing. Yeah, and how they perceive it and what would be interesting would be to interview both those who responded quickly when this was first introduced as well as people that began to participate in it or take advantage of it later in the process. Uh, I, I would just like to gain as much insight and understanding as to how people look at this. 
um, Councilman Sunsoft, right? I, I think the pandemic is a perfectly good reason for extending this again. So understand I don't have any objection to that at all. Uh, and we can certainly get a resolution prepared for council. Um, well, Sean, you said June 30th is our last day? Yes, Cindy. Okay, so we'll-, we've, we'll got, we, we've got to put it on June 8th, don't we? Or do we have, no, we've got one. Do we have one more? Yeah. We have a, a June 8th Judiciary Committee meeting scheduled, but I believe on this item, since there's no action on available on the agenda, you could direct staff under the item eight items from the Judiciary Committee to move forward and do it on whatever date. I think you could just direct us. I'm not so worried about, yeah, the committee meeting again. I, I, I want something put together that we all can look at and digest. I'm just worried about the council approving it prior to June 30th. And so we have June 8th and then we have what, June 22nd? Is that the next? Yes. We've got two Correct. more meetings to get it done. So I'll get a resolution drafted and we can bring, uh, Gaylene, if you can add that item to the Judiciary Committee for June 8th, and then uh, we can go forward to council for June, whatever it is, 22nd. John, would it be too much to ask your staff to make 10, 15, 20 calls with those that, that paid early and those who paid re recently, just asking them how they became aware, why they did it, just a, a couple of basic questions so we can get some feel if we're missing the, if we're missing the target, if we're, if we're not reaching the right social media or if we're not publicizing in the right paper, whatever. Okay, yeah, no, not a problem. Well, and I think I too, if there's a way to, if there's a way to ask folks what, what kept, like what caused, what was their perception of what caused them to let it linger so long? Because I think from my experience with folks is like, it's, it's, it's less intentional and it's either I was scared, <laughs> I didn't understand what I was supposed to do, or I didn't have the money. Um, and so like I, sort of I think it's twofold. Like, it's fine. It's financial, and it's I'm afraid to go down there and and, and deal with it. Yeah, I just I, I don't know how many folks are like oh, I'm not going to pay that parking ticket because you know I think it's I, I and I'd be curious too of like the if there's a way to without with removing any sort of um, like personal information, but if there's a way to know like what the original charge was for, and then like and see if there's any trends there too, even if it's a small data sample. I think that I. I do think that would be interesting to learn more about kind of people's experiences with the program. This is Judge James. Can I make a, a comment? Sure. I think part of the reason people come and pay, well, one of the reasons, not all, but one of the reasons is we have a state law that their license is suspended. So it's particularly with people out of state. Sometimes people don't even know their license is suspended. They literally have forgotten about the ticket. As of November the 1st, we're going to lose that leverage because the legislature passed that where we can't. But that's part of the reason people are contacting us because they might be in Texas or California someplace. They go to get their license renewed and then they find out they have their licenses suspended in Oklahoma. So they contact us because their license is suspended in California. Then, then, so that's part, of, a lot of times they find out by accident. And sometimes they're finding out because of the social media and stuff. But I'm just wondering, you know, that's 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 a lot of the people that call us. They just find out by accident when they go to, or maybe their their insurance their insurance guy might say, "Hey, did you know your license was uh, uh, suspended?" They're getting ready to renew their car insurance, and they don't know their license is suspended. So, I mean, those are some of the reasons we know about. Well, that's a whammy. That's a whammy there. So you can go get your license <laughs> updated to find that out. Um, but I, to um, Councilman Hammond's point, I guess maybe the ask could be, if you don't mind, what were the barriers or limitations that kept you from being able to pay prior to? Uh, because clearly it sounds like that would be a, a, a barrier or a limitation depending on uh, where you're from and, and if you had your license suspended or whatever the case may be. And I, I think it's important for us, although we've all agreed to this already, but 
um, because now we're going to be more integrated in our communities again, that this is going to be a, an ability for us to rev up the conversations a little bit more for us to, to work towards that effort of December. So I'm actually excited about now being able to take this into community meetings, churches, and um, actually saying, please help me or help our city and help yourselves <laughs> with this program. Council members never forget that we used to have a reputation before Judge James became presiding that even if you wanted to come in and maybe pay part of your ticket, the first thing that would happen is the clerk would notify the marshals who would come and handcuff you and take you around and cuff you to a bench by the payphone. Um, so people learned quickly uh, and it became embedded, I think, in the community don't go up there because if you can't pay it in full, you're going to get arrested. So uh, I think over time, our uh, reputation is changing. And I think LaShawn and her outreach coordinators are doing a fantastic job about that. And she has put out so much advertising about this program. It's been fantastic. Mark, uh, if, if you had contact, I would call OU's sociology department and get one of their PhD students to pull together a, you know, the research for all of this. And, and they would, I'm sure, do a good job of incorporating all these various questions and, and ideas and, and do a much more in-depth type study. It's just yeah. who's got the time. I think that's, that's a good goal to have. And, and, and I know uh, OCU has a good department for that too. Yeah. And, and so. Yeah. We've got several opportunities there. That's great. Uh, LaShawn, well, uh, we, we, uh, Judge James touched on it briefly, but court operations since all court sessions have reopened, I think everything's going well with that, correct? Yes, everything's going good. Okay, so can we turn it over to Steve? Steve, we're so glad you're here today um, as the advisor for the police department. And uh, uh, just uh, Roman numeral number seven, if you can give us a brief discussion, that we would be greatly appreciative. Sure. So at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, I reached out to the public inebriate uh, facility to find out how they were impacted by the, by the uh, pandemic and some of the uh, proclamations that were put out regarding social distancing and mask wearing. And the biggest thing was obviously they had to reduce the number of people that they could admit to the facility. Their normal capacity is 45 persons at one time. And that's divided up into 30 males and 15 females. And uh, I don't have a start date. They, they didn't even have a start that they, that they could give me. But at one point after the pandemic began, they had to reduce that to a total of 20, which was broken into 10 females and 10 males. So that meant, you know, there were a number of people that had to be turned away from detox and you know detox is an alternative to jail so that likely meant that those individuals were were taken to jail i don't have any facts to support that but i would imagine that happened more than on more, more than one occasion um, they also at the peak of the pandemic had to close the facility uh, one day a week in order to clean it and disinfect it Again, meaning on that particular day, officers did not have detox as an alternative to take um, those those persons. They're they're not closing anymore, but they still remain to this day at the reduced capacity of twenty individuals. And they did not know when that was going to change. Um, I'm sure the the person I talked to clearly wasn't the decision maker. So, I, you know, I can't fault that person for not knowing when, but they, that staff hadn't been in, hasn't been given any indication when they'll go back to full capacity. And let me ask a really dumb question. Uh, detoxification, is there one place to go? Is there more than one? There's, there's the one, there's one for Oklahoma, for Oklahoma County or Oklahoma City, I should say. Anyway, any questions? Yeah, and actually sort of goes to that question is, did you talk at all about, and I don't know, maybe this is just for us to discuss with um, Metro Alliance, um, but about opportunities for like commandeering a second location to 
you know, like just temporarily, or did they did they explore that at all to be able to provide a similar capacity as but with distancing? Well, admittedly, I did not ask them about that. I apologize, but I was I, I didn't focus on that at the time I called them. Um, so I really don't know if they are looking independently at or had or are looking at alternative locations. Um, I, I wasn't told that they were, so I really don't know the answer. Okay. And it might, I mean, it might be kind of late in the game with yeah. things trending toward in a better direction, but, um, but yeah, maybe. It could be, that's true. Uh, Chief, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, you, you might make a phone call and ask a couple more questions and just send us a two paragraph email. Still there? Hey. Looks like his computer froze up. Uh, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I can tell you are asking me a question, <laughs> but I did not hear any of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, would you make another call, ask a few more questions based upon what we talked about today, and then just send us a short two, bar two paragraph email, nothing lengthy, just kind of what you found out. Sure you, don't we have a contract with that facility, the city? Uh, well, I know the police work with Metro Alliance to run it. Um, I've not seen a contract, so I don't know if it's an MOU or if we, we actually partially fund it. You might double check that and see if there are any constraints through some agreement. We do have contracts with Metro Alliance. Oh, good. The voice of reason came through, Debbie. So, um, I don't have anything else other than to ask Debbie Martin, uh, do any of the counselors have any other meetings we need to be at after this? <laughs> yes, I, I, have a, I have a commencement speech to give to oh, no. eighth graders at six. Right. How fun. With that, we are adjourned. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, Gaylene. Bye, Steve. Bye, Cindy. Bye. Bye. <laughs> the leave button. Oh, there you <laughs>